In the book of Romans chapter 13, our text is verses 11 through 14. Here we read, And that, knowing it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us, therefore, cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put you on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. You've heard the saying, the darkest hour is just before dawn. These words are not a cliché. They actually state a natural truth or physical truth that is observable. And it is a truth that illustrates a great spiritual truth. Because, folks, this world is getting darker. And the dark world is getting darker. And the darkest giving periods of darkness and light. Notice what is said. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. From the very outset, to always use his definitions, not the definitions of men. Spiritual and moral conditions are deteriorating in our world. We're not making progress. We're going downhill. Churches are compromising on moral issues right and left. They are not taking a stand against the evil of the world. Whatever the world claim it does not make it true. You know, here we're a society that are allowing children, if those children think that they are different than the way they were born, a different sex, if they think that they are of a different sex and they identify that, we're all supposed to go along with it. Hogwash. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my whole life. You do not d let somebody else define the issues that God has defined. You don't redefine. But God's people, I'm afraid, or the, the Christian world, so-called at least, has been doing that for a long time. But the hour, last days, perilous or dangerous times shall come. You know, there's folks in some of the cities here in the United States, they can't afford to be out at night be in certain places, they'll be certainly um, uh, picked on. And now in certain places like New York City, someone can commit a horrible crime and they'll be released on their own recognizant right away and come out and do another crime but while they're being charged with the first crime. This men will not improve things. Their innovations will make matters worse. They'll make matters worse naturally trying to be the savers of the climate. They're going to mess that up. You watch and see. Just wait and see how it's going to work out. And they're going to do that with all of these efforts to make equity. This is why we're having of his own fallen nature. Now, what does this have to do that I'm saying in connection with the text? Here in the 13th chapter of the book of Romans, we have noted that government has, is God's institution. The powers that be are ordained of God. That's verses 1 through 7 of Romans 13. And government is an antidote to lawlessness. Lawlessness is an enemy of mankind. Lawlessness is what many in our country are pushing for. They want lawlessness. They want government to even encourage it and to bless lawlessness. And so we're against the police. We're against so many things in this day that you and I probably thought years ago we would never hear anyone say. But the government was given to punish the wicked. That says, because iniquity shall abound. Let's, King James, which means he that hinders will hinder until he be taken out of the way. And so there is the Lord's purpose to limit what men can do, and he does it until to have everything they want to bring about their own destruction. And that's what he's going to do. Revelation chapter 19 shows the climax of this thing. Now, because lawlessness is, it is against, opposed to love. Paul has mentioned, after he mentions government, he mentions love. 
in verses, uh, what is it here? As we look at verses 8 through 10, he mentions love here. And that we're to owe no man anything but to love one another. Because when you do that, you fulfill law. There is no law against love. If you love somebody, you love, you're going to do them right. You're not going to do them harm. You're not going to be lawless toward them. You're not going to disregard the law of God. You will follow the law in every regard. We, as God's people, are sometimes, who believe in the doctrines of grace, we have been referred to as antinomians, against the law. We're not against, against the law. We're not against, against the law. That's what the wicked do. They like to misrepresent what other people do. By the way, if you love people, you'll never misrepresent their view. You'll never accuse them of teaching something they don't accuse. Don't ever be guilty of that. That is not love. But love fulfills the law. Love and law go together. That is what the apostle has shown us here in this chapter. Now, it is in light of the fact that he's laid this foundation concerning that government is God's institution. It is a servant to his people, and it is a friend to those that do good. It is to be the, raised up to punish those that do evil and wicked things, and that we as God, the police force doesn't have to go around t making you love others, do they? They don't have to go around telling you that you've got to stop doing this thing because you're not going to trash your neighbor's lawn. <laughs> you're not going to try to destroy his car. You're not going to do anything like that. Love will not do that. But wickedness will. And so in order to restrain and hold it down, God raised up government. They'll get worse before they are better. The apostle then gives certain admonitions in this text that we want to pay attention to this evening. What are these admonitions? Well, the first admonition that he gives is for us to awake out of sleep when we believe. Now, he says, and knowing the time, the word time here is the word that is also rendered season. It is translated quite often in the King James as season. We, we as God's people of Israel, that was noted for knowing the times. Here's the reading. And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. The heads of them were 200 and so on. But here's the thing. If there were those in that day that knew and understood the times, should we not all as God's people, excuse me, should we not all be those who know the times? Now the particular statement that the apostle uses here when he says and that knowing the time, he is, and makes this assumption with reference to God's people because they have the Holy Spirit within them teaching them. And it was true of him that he had come to know it intuitively as a result of God's teaching by the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit had made this a settled conviction, much like what I mentioned this morning concerning the confidence that Paul had, because it's the same perfect tense, and it denotes a settled conviction that he had come to. For example, let's come to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4, because we'll read here in the Word of God these particular statements that are made concerning the last days. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. I don't know whether you're noticing some of this, but even certain Christian authors that have been successful selling, selling books to God's people now are turning away from the faith that they once espoused. That's what's happening in our day. Again, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verses 2 and 3 gives this warning particularly to preachers as, as they live in these days the, to do this. Preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season. That is, an, whether it's convenient or whether it's not. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. In other words, they want to hear what they want to hear. That's all they want to hear. Don't tell me the truth. Tell me what I want to hear. And that's a pretty dumb thing because if people are being told what they want to hear that will bring about their destruction, how in the world does that help? Be better not to hear anything than to hear something like that. And John writes in 1 John 2, 8, My little children, it is the last time. We are in the last. When John wrote at the, and at the end of the first century, when he wrote, he was writing concerning the, this dispensation of the gospel. And it's the last one. 
here. We're in the last hour. This will bring about the end of the domain and the, the dominion of men. It will be from their own under God's dominion. So he says, it's time for us to wake out of sleep. Now, the, the statement is used here, the expression, it's high time. I don't know whether any of you remember. The hour is the, definitely here. It is, very, it is the time to get up and to wake out of sleep. We cannot have any kind of drowsiness spiritually. We can't afford that, folks. There's too much at stake. Our lives, our families, God's people, we must be alert. We must be fully awake. Because one who is asleep, He's oblivious to what is going on around him. He doesn't have a clue about what is about to, to happen and what he needs to do. So there's warnings all through the scriptures about our being awake in the book of Proverbs. And I love to see the take on things in the book of Proverbs because those, that's a wisdom book. And Proverbs 20, 13, Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. You need sleep. Get sleep that you need, but don't love sleep and try to overdo it. That's the teaching of Scripture. Now, in the New Testament, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, and uh, verse 14, we read these words. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. And he's talking to God's people. Arise. You're going to have a vibrant life. You're going to be, there's going to be a vitality about you. Come out of that sleepiness as and that, that the world wants to lull us to be in, to lull us to sleep with all of its promises, with all the things that are going to get better. Why, we're always going to improve everything, right? It's just going to be wonderful. And, and we've seen in the last two years how quickly a country can go down. Now, the apostle says, our salvation is nearer than when we believe. That is a self-evident truth if we understand how the word salvation is used. I suggested it this morning. Let me remind you that salvation is used in three tenses. There is salvation past. That's what regeneration is. There's salvation present. That's what sanctification is. Now, it's not the flesh that's getting better. I want to make that clear. Many people think that somehow or another the flesh is going to be sanctified. No, the flesh will always be the flesh. It's going to die. But a growth in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ is that which is characteristic of those that are being saved. They are the ones who are being set apart more and more to the Lord. But then there is the salvation future, and that's the glorification of the body. So at each time there's a deliverance. Now is our salvation or our deliverance nearer than when we believe? Well, we were delivered from the penalty of sin already. That's past. We are being delivered from the power of sin. That's presence. But one day we're going to be delivered from the very presence of sin. And that's when we'll get the new body. Now, Paul references this in 1 Thessalonians. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you see, he's writing to save people. If we do not make these distinctions in how the word salvation is used, and we learn that from the Scriptures, then we're going to be confused because we say, I thought we were already saved. Well, we are, but we're going to obtain salvation. Yes, we are, because there's a different sense. We're going to obtain the deliverance that comes from the presence of sin and this old body, and we will be brought into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what awaits the children of God. But the second admonition is given here in verses 12 and 13. And that is the admonition to cast off the works of darkness and to put on the armor of light. Now let's note the reading again here in verse 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. The night is it's just about over. It's to come to the end. And that's where we're living now. The time period that is, the, the, that is set forth in Scripture for where we now live is night. The night is far spent. It's about over. The day is at hand. Now, that's a, that's a way that they had in the days of the King James Bible to express that it draws near. The day of the day draws near. Now, I want to give you something here that was a blessing to me 
as I just considered the fact that Christ is the light of the world. Let's note John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. What world? He's not the light of the wicked, the ones that lie in darkness. He is the light of those that are in the world of light. Now, if you haven't picked this up in your study, you will if you look closely. The word world is used different ways. There's not just one world. Many people have John 3, 16 as the world only one and only world, and that includes all people without exception. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That God loves everyone the same. That's not what the Bible teaches. I'm going to show you. The word world doesn't always mean the same. Christ said in John chapter 17, verse 9, I pray for you, I pray not for the world. Now, I always ask this question to make you think. Why would he pray for a world that he, love a world that he wouldn't pray for? If it's the same world, why would he love a world that he wouldn't pray for? It's because there's different worlds. Are we not also taught love not the world? That's a different world, is it not? We're not to, we're to love one another, but we're not to love the world. So that can't be the same. I'm just suggesting to you, you want to let the Bible define to you what world it's talking about at any given time. And the Bible says that concerning the Jews' concern after the resurrection of Lazarus, that the whole world went after Jesus. Well, they were talking about the Jewish world, you see. And so there's different worlds that you want to see in Scripture. Christ is the light of the world of his people. That's who he is the light of. Now, while he was in the world, he was the light of the world. Okay? While he was in the world, he was in the light of the world, the Jewish world, because there was the world. He was in the world, and the world uh, knew him not, John 1, 11. But in John chapter 1, turn with me, I want you to see what is said. The Bible says in verse 4, in him was light, and the life was the light of men. Now he came to save fallen mankind, his people that were fallen in Adam. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The darkness couldn't lay hold on this kind of light. Even though it was light, they couldn't lay hold on it. And then he says in verse 9, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. That is the world of God's people. He lights them. He brings them into the world. Christ was in the world. And while he was in the world, it was called day. John 9, 4. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. All right. Now, he's the, light, he's the light, but the night comes when no man can work. There's another statement in John 13, 30 that you'll wonder, why was this said like this? It's so obvious that when they were observing the Passover and that Judas went out, he went out in the night. But there's more said because John especially is always giving more than just the obvious. John 13, 30, he or Judas, then having received the sop, went immediately out and it was night. Okay, now that came about when he was going to be betrayed by Judas and would be taken that very night. And he would be taken by the Jewish authorities, turned over to Pilate, and he would be sentenced to death. But the Bible says the reason the scripture says that when Judas went out, it was night. It was terminating the day that had been. We're in the night. But there is the day of Jesus Christ that is coming again. That's at his second coming. And I noted that this morning in the Philippian passage of Scripture. So now we go back to Genesis and we can see that God laid this all out for us in the reconstruction of the earth in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1.1 1, 1 is the creative statement. In Genesis 1.2, the earth is shown to be without form and void. God didn't create it that way. If you want to check on that, just go over to the book of Isaiah 45, 18, and he says exactly opposite that he created it not in vain. And yet it is without void form and without void. It's, it's the same word, tohu, in the Hebrew language. All right? So what does the Lord do in the seven or the six days? He reconstructs the earth. He brings out of chaos order. That's a picture of what the Lord 
does for us in saving us. We're fallen in Adam. God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the glory of the knowledge of Jesus, of Jesus Christ, to give the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, to give a knowledge of that glory. He has done that. This is a picture. So notice how it is said, verse, verses 3 through 5. God said, let there be light, and there was light. That's the first thing that he does when he is reconstructing the earth, let there be light. When he comes to saving us, Jesus Christ is our light. He gives us light. And the light, remember, the life was the light of men. His light is the light that comes into our hearts. God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Always separation from the two, the darkness and the light. And he called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Now men can make all kinds of claims and all kinds of statements about what the time is, but the fact of the matter is that the Lord Jesus has already stated that the day, the light, is called day. And those who are of the light are called, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the children of the day. Okay? They are called that. And those who are in darkness are of the night. They are separated from the people of God. Now that's a study. If you get your concordance and you follow that through, you're going to be blessed just to contrast all the times and see how consistent it is <coughs> that the Lord uses these terms. But now we are in the night and the, the, the day though is drawing near. Now what does that thus cause us and why do we need an admonition? We need to be aware of the times and because it draws near, it is time for us, therefore, to cast off the works of darkness, our bodies as instruments of righteousness unto God. Romans 6, 13. It's translated armor in the book of 2 Corinthians 6, 7. 6, 7 reads like this. By the word of God, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness. Our armor is righteousness. And that we are to be sure that we're wearing that, that that is obvious in our lives. It's translated weapons in 2 Corinthians 10.4. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. This is the kind of thing that we're to put on. We're to put these on. This denotes a spiritual preparedness for warfare. Folks, we're in a war. Now, let's, let's, let's be ready for some things. This warfare of the wicked is going to ramp up because... They believe that they can cause everybody to submit by force. Get ready for another pandemic. That's already being planned. And they shut down churches and nearly destroyed churches in the last one because people went along. Get ready to resist. It may be costly. It may cost us short, in the short run. It will be a blessed blessing in the long run. We cannot live in fear. Bank account. Your security is not in your standing. Your security is in God. Always remember that. And what he has promised, he will do. He will take care of his children. I have been reading about the sufferings of the Anabaptists in the 1600s in Europe. All oh, those people took a stand. It was costly. But God blessed them. And the truth and their children continue to this day. The wicked cannot stamp out the righteous. God will not permit it. He is the one who will take care of his people. But let us, in the meantime, put on the armor of light. And let us walk on one thing and do another. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envyings. We're not to, to be noted for any of those things. The works of darkness are specially specified here in this text that we are especially to put on. They are rioting. Now, isn't it interesting that we've had riots in our streets in America in the last few years? Interesting. The word is also rendered revelings, where we revel after a way to celebrate. That's about the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And it ought to be called out as dumb. But rather, it is always approved. The media approves it. And the people in the world, while well, they're just expressing their resentment at things like that. Don't listen to this further statement concerning revelings and such. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. 
There was a time in our lives when we belonged to that crowd, but not now. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banqueting, and abominable idolatries. We're not to be a part of that. No, or nor are we to have anything to do with chambering and wantonness. Now, I'll just say kind of th dealings with that kind of people and that kind of actions. Nor are we to have anything to do with strife and envyings. You know what today represents strife and envyings? Out there in the world today is why we know the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. So the third and the final admonition here is in verse 14. And that is the admonition to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. But in place of these other things, put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. The tense of the Greek imperative verb is aorist, which denotes put him on at once. Don't delay. Put him on once for all. That's what we're to do. Put him on. Uh, uh, put him on. Well, how do we do that? Well, we get a help from Galatians 3, 27. For as many form of baptism in that passage. How do we put him on here in this passage? We put him on by identifying ourselves with him. Taking a stand with him. Standing with him against the world. Standing with him against the practices that are evil in this world. Standing with him and letting it be known. Not in any way being afraid or ashamed to identify with the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you identify a policeman? Isn't it by his uniform? And if we are to so be identified with him, that is, it's like putting on a uniform. It is like putting him on. That's the analogy, something that we're to do ourselves. Colossians 3.10 says, no, you have put on the new man. You have put him on. We've put him on before God. We need, as it were, to very visibly and gladly and openly wear him, as it were, to show and identify to the world that we, we can't do that if we're guilty of these works of darkness, if we don't put them off. We put them off, we don't have anything to do with them, and we follow the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're noted as the Lord's people. That that's the case. All of us have to do some repenting, do we not? Confess your sin, turn from it. And he says, and let us not, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Now that's an imperative verb, but it's in the present tense. He says, the, the people not plan to go to the liquor store to get their booze, the people not plan to go out here to the, uh, the uh, place where they want to get their, their mar marijuana? Do they not make plans for that? Do people not make plans for their adultery? You don't make any provision for the flesh. You have to cut the flesh off at the feet. And listen, the enemy you're going to deal with is the worst, more than the world, more than the devil, is your own flesh and what it wants to do. It's so easy to, to be governed by the flesh. I want to do that. I like to do that. I'm going to do that for myself. No, you've got to cut it off. Make no provision for the flesh. We've taught, we've learned that back in Romans chapter 6. Let's come back, if you will, to verse 12. Romans chapter 6 and verse 12. Here the scripture says, Let not sin therefore reign. Don't let it be the one that controls your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Don't let that happen. Well, how can I keep that from happening? I'm glad you hour is indeed just before dawn and that is true spiritually and that is what where we are today dear people i want you to know that we're in the darkest hour but dawn is coming the day is at hand the day or the night that is i should say the night of darkness and our father we are thus in view of that fact knowing that's the case we're to be done with the world he delivered us from it. We don't want to hold on to it. What does it have to offer? Sorrow, troubles, strife, all kinds of heartache and heartbreak. People look in his ways. Let's put off all the ways of the world and let's be looking to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to end this message by turning to Titus 2, 11 through 14. Brother Bill and I were discussing this morning the fact that when the Lord saves us, that we'll ever need. It's there. The issue it reads beginning at verse 11. For the grace of God
that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Okay? It is all kinds of all classes, all nations of men. It has come. But that same grace that has appeared does what? Verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's what I've been talking about here from Romans 13. Looking for that blessed and hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's grace that enables us to do that, that gives us the desire to do that. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify in himself a, a peculiar people, not an odd people, a people of his own is the sense of peculiar, zealous of good works. Where does all of that come from? The grace of God. The grace of God has been given to you. By the way, when Paul had the thorn in the flesh, what did the Lord tell him? You need to get grace. I can give you grace for this. He says, no, my grace is sufficient. You already have it. You already have that grace. God's given us grace to follow him in these days. Not to fear, not to worry, not to fret about what the wicked do. Because they love to boast and brag and say what they're going to do. They only can do what God permits them to do. He's got his hand upon them and he limits them. He makes the wrath of man to praise him and the remainder of wrath he restrains.